Ten Commandments, uh, Rod has kind of put me on to that because I always had those in verbatim form. And first of all, I want to express my deep gratitude towards all of you who've stuck this out and towards our uh, organizers, our sponsors, but also all of you who have been so patient. Uh, it's great to be back in a full house. And again, the camaraderie, this will only enhance itself in the lab, is phenomenal. We want to make you the best spine surgeons on the planet, optimize your potential, and execute every patient every time. And a great source of uh, a kind of inspiration and validation is what happens in the NHS. One of our speakers here, who's a frequent writer, is uh, a, a guy named Mike Hutton, and he runs this Get It Right the First Time initiative. It's free. Check out the NHS website, the largest spine database with real data uh, on planet Earth. And they want to basically have things go right the first time. And so, for instance, if you want to see how many spine deformities should you do in a year, in your place per annum, 40 is the minimum critical number right there this is all there realize that spine surgery is so amazing spine care is even more pronounced but it's an application of Murphy's law where if you miss something everything will go wrong and can go wrong uh, to highest degrees of punitive damages Y10 it's again a classic a biblical literary uh, a common sense thing to kind of count down things and again this is not meant to be true commandments these are more inspirations talking points and you may think that these, some of these are petty little marginalities, but I really, uh, uh, I always since a little boy, found Muhammad Ali, then Cassius Clay, to be an inspirational uh, person who basically identified that every little thing counts. They can hurt you big time, but they can also make you better if you pay attention to them. And so this is a very minuscule kind of a talking points assembly of what uh, Dave Skagg so beautifully formulated, what you heard this morning also in Chris Shaffrey's excellent talk. And so when I looked at and had the great privilege of traveling and being exposed to many great surgeons, when I saw secrets <clears throat> of success in the long run, for instance, the great John Jane or Professor Majid Sami, who's at age 85 still doing highly complex skull-based surgeries, I saw something amazing in their ores. And it is just like what David Skaggs does. It's calm, organized, they're clearly passionate, and they clearly love what they're doing, just like Rod Eskuyan. There's this amazing ethereal uh, atmosphere in Majid Sami's OR. It's beautiful. So in this vein, accept my Ten Commandments as a humble talking point. And again, all the faculty after it's come out will bring the microphones up, and it's a free for all basically until we head into the lab and follow Kojo's instruction. So number one, it all starts with the patient and ends with the patient. Right patient, right time, right location, and the right side. No Columbus surgery, that's no exploring around, okay? <laughs> and this cannot be overemphasized, and this means you're really prepared, you're thoughtful for each patient. Number two, sounds so silly, sounds so trivial. Positioning, don't have compromises. Orthogonal positioning, distract, detract, every single thing counts. The arm tension that you see here, release it after you've done your heart replacement, uh, unless you absolutely need it, because it puts uh, plexus uh, pressure and probably pulls on the C5 nerve root. So this is one of those things. But head height matters. I've had three blindness patients in my life. The head, the eyes should be above the heart level. So I'm looking at my team here right now, head above heart level. No questions, no ifs. Chin, throat, everything matters. Are the EKG leads in that bi-directional C-arm imaging, are the EKG leads in your pathway? One of a myriad of examples where Murphy's Law applies. In my tubular days, uh, we had a beautiful microdiscectomy. I had the, the residents do the, I had exposed everything. We had a great visualization of the disc. Would you believe that the knife blade broke off? And so here we're in the tube trying to fish it out. And as uh, initially the fellow then I tried to start fish out that knife blade, the EKG lead was right over this area at four or five. <laughs> I took the tube out, opened it up, we got it out safely. But basically this is a classic for me, ingrained and burnished is the better word, example of EKG leads matter, those stupid little things. Keep them away from where you're operating. Think about that. Head clamp, is it right? Does it pass a jiggle test? Yes, no. Yes. One of my many pet peeves, do not drape yourself out. Words I don't want to hear is it's prepped underneath. Classic example, you're going up to T3 and the drape ends at T1. Guess what's going to happen? <laughs> you're not going to have the angle. You're going to compromise. You're going to wedge, whatever. This is just bad preparation. You should be basically able to access whatever you have, however you want to do it, percutaneously open, wide and open. So this just tells me, again, preparation has been there. 
Exposure, clear and dry. This is one of those things you should be able as young surgeons to start timing yourself and get a, a time period of exposures. How long does it take me to do a nice dry exposure? At the completion of which you ask, how much time did I spend? How much blood did I lose? This would be in your parameters so you form your own library of how long does it do, how long should it take me to do a, a minimally invasive or open? I don't care, exposure. Uh, less blood loss, better start, preserve ligaments and adjacent ligaments, segments. It drives me nuts, and sorry, I'm not looking at anybody in the room here, when we're doing an L2 to 5 decompression fusion and we expose T12 down to about L4 and a half. Questa la causa? Nescio, I don't understand. <laughs> Uh, this goes to everybody, no intended dural tear. I personally think and I document in the complications any unanticipated dural invasion. It may not lead to a consequence to the patient, half an hour minimum extra time, extra resources, extra headaches, extra, extra, extra. It happens. I have a 5.2% dural uh, tear rate. Why do I know that? Because I check it. My, uh, our quality nurse tells me, I have one of the higher rates, and I ask her one thing, how many secondary neurologic deficits, how many unintended returns to the OR do we have? Almost none. That's what matters, I repair. But I also am the only one next to Rod, next to Amir, who voluntarily says this was a complication. Curious to hear the thoughts of my colleagues here. Number six, more and more gadgets in the room. This is for me one of those kind of zen-like things of control in the OR. Don't get your cables messed, don't drop things. Don't put things on the OR, uh, on the patient, unless it's attending privilege. But this bottom right-hand thing will set you up for failures. And in my Harborview days, when you dropped your Midas, you were SOL. Maybe if it's in daytime, you got a new one in about 15 to 30 minutes. I'm not harping on it. This is, you can extrapolate that to any non-spine dedicated place. But dropping tools is a big deal. The more cables we have, the more ultrasonic here and uh, 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 whatever ultrasonic uh, uh, defibrillator, whatever, whatever cable stuff you have floating around, the less you have and the more organized you have it is better. Great opportunity for teamwork, like what Dr. Skagg said. Ask, when you start seeing a mess occurring, ask your scrub tech, hey, can you disentangle me here? You will notice a magical decrease in unintended drops. I consider it a 15 yard penalty when we drop something. I take it personal. So stay organized, that's the basic mantra here. Uh, so number seven, this is again a pet peeve of mine. What is more frustrating than after a major T whatever, four to pelvis surgery, I'm sure, uh, I'll do a show of hands here, you've all seen this, when the cotinoid count is off, right? Who's had it happen, show of hands? Who's not had it happen? You're not show, raising your hands, never had a cotinoid count off? Wow, I wanna hear your thoughts, no, I mean it. It's cool. No, it was a template. <laughs> no, but that's, that's, that goes, I mean, but this is great organization right there. There's a simple thing against that. They're either in the patient or on the Mayo stand. They never, however in a rush you are, they never end up on the patient. Or if so, because you're in a great hurry, tell the scrub tech there's a cotinoid right on the field. You don't want to have a half by half missing at the end and having half of the OR on their knees and pulling out the suckers and whatever. Uh, it's a big mess. Whether it matters to the patient or not, it's a different story. But have everything organized and you're in charge in a calm fashion, in the patient, in your hands, or on the back table, or you announce, I'm going to harbor this. This is an older uh, uh, artist that uh, is a generational identifier. Anybody know who Paul Simon is, show of hands? <laughs> All the old guys. <laughs> Very few, you're an exception. You're generation Z, where are you? You're third now, okay, so you don't count. You're, you're, you're a fake out. Paul Simon had a great song. I usually put the audio in, subsliding away. And this word passage here is so telling, subsiding away. You know the nearer your destination, the more you're subsiding away, the further you're away. Slipping and sliding, plunging are the nemesis of a successful outcome. You want to be in control of your power tools. Usually a two-hand rule, especially for the trainees, uh, pedicle finders, curettes, cobs, uh, just be assured. These are cutting, these are powerful tools. They can maim patients, they can drop, they can change a very successful surgery into a devastation in a short while. So no plunges, slips or slides, you need to organize it. This is where cadaver labs are great. Finally, number nine, take pride in what you do. Appearances do matter. Whether it's a skin incision, I can't tell you how many patients, they love our four layered closures. They come to me and say, you did a beautiful job here. They may have pain, but that, you did a great job. Uh, beware of your x-ray aesthetics. What's the best business card in the world, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hicks? A nice looking x-ray, print it out in your office with your name on it, print it out, it'll end up in the fridge with a magnet. It has your name on it, right, Dr. Hicks? 
And those patients, everyone in the family said, this is what's in my back now. If those x-rays look nice, I swear, and Dr. Shaffrey always said that, is there an aesthetic to that x-ray? It'll probably correlate to a good uh, thing. If the x-rays look really catawampus and screws all over and whatever, maybe it's not so good. That story, like, oh, biomechanically doesn't make any difference. And I call the air Jordan screws when you look at the lateral x-rays and one like this and one like that and say, no, that's not good, guys. If you have, uh, I'll use an acronym, but CRAPPY -A 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 screws. The great John Jane always said, I've never regretted taking a patient back to the OR. I've regretted not taking a patient back many times, right? This is so, if you're in doubt about something, it's close to something, you're just not feeling right about it. That's the famous gut check. Big gut in my case. That's, a, uh, that's something to just consider. Take it out early. The patient will forgive you. Uh, you're transparent about this. And the appearances, again, I'm still not sure that I like the aesthetic of the Uzi approach of the spine seen on the bottom left, but that's superior to a nice straight midline. I have a whole talk about that. Finally, the ultimate thing. This is not just the patient, this is you, this is your scrub tech, nobody gets hurt. Was the x-ray exposure, was making sure that people are safe, your assistant, whether you pass your sharp instruments blunt side first to your scrub tech, or hand them mindlessly your long handled uh, 15 blade back, uh, that's something you wanna be super careful about that includes the hot bovine. Nobody gets hurt, that includes yourself. Listen to all the ergonomic things, but think about uh, everybody and that's the patient. So this is where I come to a conclusion. The mantra that I always find is, it's not how fast you do a surgery, it's being efficient and being precise. This is a very big thing. It's mental, it's physical, it's the basic overall uh, thing.